Well, we want to right now welcome in our Sault Ste. Marie campus. Thank you for joining us, being part of our worship today. Certainly our online campus, we welcome you, our TV audience, radio audience, those at the Tall Timber Church down in Florida. You watch every week. We're glad to have you and also out on Boyce Blanc Island. We welcome all of you to our service this morning. Well, if you have your Bible, open it, please, to Daniel chapter 2. If you're using a device, pull up Daniel chapter 2. And we're going to continue today. This is week number three in our 10-week series, Through the Life of Daniel. We're going through the first six chapters of the book of Daniel in a series we've called, When Culture Requires Courage. And one of the things we've pointed out through this series, and we'll keep pointing out, is this. When we talk about the courage as seen in the Bible, we're not talking about the type of courage that's often touted as virtuous in the church today. Because that courage seems to be a harsh courage, a mean-spirited courage, a militant courage. No, this is a humble courage. And why is that important? Because a harsh courage will accomplish absolutely nothing of eternal importance. But a humble courage impacts people. And we'll see that again today. Now, remember as the story started, King Nebuchadnezzar became the king of Babylon. He invaded Jerusalem. In a series of deportations, he will ultimately take literally tens of thousands of Jewish people into captivity. But the first group he takes is the cream of the crop. And these are a group of men who he is going to put through a three-year indoctrination program in order to basically strip away all of their Jewish history and heritage and culture and make them into Babylonians. Then he wants to use them to rule over the Jewish people for the glory of Babylon. Daniel and his three friends, who are known primarily by their Babylonian names, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, are four of those individuals. And they find themselves at about 15 years of age, ripped from their home, ripped from their culture, ripped from their land, ripped from their families, and taken to Babylon, where they have to show a humble courage in a heathen culture. Now, we've already seen what that entails. We've seen, number one, that to have a humble courage requires that you must firmly believe that God is the God of history. In other words, it doesn't matter what happens in the culture, what happens in the news, what happens in the elections, God is in control. And if you firmly believe that, you will show a humble courage in a heathen culture. If you don't believe that, you will become one of those believers who somehow think they have to wrestle back control of our culture to give back to God. And I've told you, you do not need to wrestle back control of our culture for God because God has never been out of control to begin with. So you have to believe that God is the God of history. Then we saw last week that to show a humble courage in a heathen culture, I need to know, first of all, where to draw the line. And I showed you last Sunday, there's only one legitimate place for a believer in Jesus to draw the line in the culture we live in. And that's when the commands that are given to us would cause us to violate the word of God. But not only do you need to know where to draw the line, you need to know how to draw the line. And we're going to see more of that as we continue the story of Daniel today. Now, as we move into Daniel chapter 2, I need you to understand that this chapter is one of the pivotal chapters, not just in the book of Daniel, not just in the Old Testament. This is one of the most important chapters in all of the Bible. In this chapter, and we won't really see the details till next week, God is going to give King Nebuchadnezzar a dream. And in this dream, he is going to present to the king what the future looks like when it comes to Gentile world powers. And basically, here's the theme of the dream. It's the theme of the chapter. The theme is this. Human kingdoms will come and go, but only the kingdom of God will last forever. That's the theme to Daniel chapter 2, and that's what we'll ultimately see next week. So we want to begin, though, by reading chapter 2, verse number 1. Notice what it says. It says, now in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams, and his spirit was troubled by those dreams, these reoccurring dreams. And as a result, his sleep left him. He's so troubled, he can no longer sleep. 
Now, before we get into the narrative of the story, I want to point out something of historical value. And as I point this out, some of you are going to kind of think it's mundane. Some of you may end up kind of be sitting in your seat going, who cares? But it really is important. And here's why. Because what you believe about the Bible will be the foundation to your faith. I believe four facts about the Bible. On these four facts, I cannot be moved. I believe that when God gave the Bible, it was the inspired word of the living God. I believe it's been preserved accurately for us today. I believe that it contains everything God wants me to know to do everything God wants me to do. I'm not looking for God to speak to me in any other way. And I believe, number four, that it is the final authority for my life. And what you believe about the Bible will be the foundation to your faith. Now, there are many today who do not believe the Bible is the word of God. And some who reject it, reject it on this basis. They say it cannot be the word of God because there are contradictions in the Bible. There are many contradictions in the Bible. Now, I would correct them and say this. There are many apparent contradictions in the Bible. And I believe that if you study, every contradiction in the Bible has an explanation. And I never want you to let these apparent contradictions trip you up. This is an example of one of them. It's the historical footnote, the timeline. Because it says in verse number one, that when chapter two opens up, it is the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign. And that's where skeptics say that cannot be true. Because remember at the beginning of chapter 1, Nebuchadnezzar just became king. It was the first year of his reign. He takes Daniel and the others into captivity. They go through a three-year indoctrination program. Chapter 1 ends at the end of that program. So it's been three years. So how can chapter 2 verse 1 say... It's just the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign. And skeptics say, see, there are inaccuracies in the Bible. Well, if you study, you'll discover it's not inaccurate at all. Because Daniel is giving us the monarch line by Babylonian reckoning. And the Babylonians did it different than we would or that the Jews did. You see, in Babylonian reckoning, The first year of the king was never counted as his first year because that was considered to be his year of ascension to the throne. So really his first year as king doesn't start until his second year on the throne. The reason for that is this, because in Babylonian monarch tradition and culture and etiquette, when a king died, that entire year of his death was still credited to him. That's why the new king is only considered to be ascending to the throne and he doesn't really start his reign till the following year. That's what happened to Nebuchadnezzar. In 605 BC, his father, King Nebuchadnezzar, died. Nebuchadnezzar took the throne, conquered Jerusalem, took Daniel into captivity. But that first year was his year of ascension. It was not considered his first year of reign. That is why chapter 2 verse 1 says it's the second year of his reign. We would say it was his third year. But their first year, they said, was his year of ascension. So if you know culture and you know history, you realize that the Bible is completely accurate when it says it was the second year of King Nebuchadnezzar's reign. Folks, I point that out to you just to say this to you. You can trust your Bible. You can trust your Bible. That's why here at E-Free, we say that one of the six catalysts to spiritual growth is for you to read your Bible every single day. Now, with that out of the way, let's get back to the narrative. Now, we have the king. And the king has a dream, a reoccurring dream. Now, we're going to learn later on in the text next week that what prompted this dream was the king was doing a lot of thinking about his legacy. What's going to happen to my kingdom when I'm gone? And that thought produced these dreams. And there was one dream in particular that bothered him. He knew it was significant. 
He knew it had a meaning. He believed it probably came from one of the gods, but he did not know what it meant. And as a result, he was a mess. He could not even sleep. Now, by the way, that would teach us a very valuable lesson. King Nebuchadnezzar was the most powerful man in the world at the time. But folks, power never equals peace. He did not have peace. Power does not equal peace. The king is agitated. Now, how many of you know this principle? You may have seen it played out somewhere in your families or at work. How many of you know the principle that says this? Agitated people agitate people. Is that not true? Agitated people agitate other people. And the only thing worse than someone who's agitated is having the most powerful dictator in the world who's agitated. He needs an answer. So what does he do? Verse 2. Then the king gave orders to call in, and there's four groups of people. We'll talk about who they are in a moment. To call in the magicians, the conjurers, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans. And what does he want them to do? Notice the next phrase. It's crucial. He wants them to tell him his dreams. Now don't miss it. He he knows exactly what he's going to do. He's not calling them in to say, hey guys, let me tell you what I dreamed. You tell me what it means. He's not doing that. He's calling them in and saying this. All right, guys, I had this wild dream. I need you to tell me what it was and then give me the interpretation. Now, some would suggest that the king had forgotten the details of the dream and that's why he did this. I can understand that to a point. Maybe you've had one of those scenarios where uh, you woke up and you said to your spouse, honey, I had the most amazing dream last night, but I just can't remember it. Have you ever had that happen? So he, here he is. And so maybe that, I don't think that's what happened to the king. I don't think so at all. And we're going to see that in a second. We'll see why the king did it this way. Let's keep reading. So they came in and they stood before the king, those four groups. And the king said, I have dreamed a dream. My spirit is anxious to understand the dream. Tell me the dream and the interpretation. Now, let's talk about those four groups before we see what they say. Notice who they are. First, there's the magicians. They would have been the fortune tellers of that day. All four of these groups have occultic ties. Now, if you go back to the book of Deuteronomy, there are two things that God strictly forbids of his people that are tied to the occult. One is communicating, attempting to communicate with the dead, and two, is predicting the future. These groups are all about those two things. So you have the magicians, they're fortune tellers. You know the number one way in Babylon, these magicians would tell you your fortune? They wouldn't read the palm of your hand. They would kill an animal, take out the liver, cut the liver open, and looking inside the liver, they would see. Can you imagine that your future is in the inside of the liver of an animal? I don't like that kind. But that's what they did. Then you had the conjurers. Those were the ones who claimed to speak with the dead. Then you had the sorcerers. That was witchcraft. That was the potions, the charms. Then you had the Chaldeans. Now, by the way, the Chaldeans were also known as, and you'll want to remember this, the wise men. That's what Chaldeans were also known as. And now you're going to begin to see there is a link between Daniel and the story of Christmas. And I'm going to show you that link Christmas Sunday morning. Now, the Chaldeans, the wise men, they were into astrology and astronomy. They tried to predict the future by looking at the stars. All four of these groups focused on the occult. Now, you have to understand in the Babylonian mindset, um, A king would never do anything without consulting these guys. Because he doesn't want to do anything to make the gods mad. And these guys have the ear of God, the gods. And these guys prided themselves on being able to interpret dreams. They had volumes of books that had been uncovered in history about their findings. You know how they did it? They would interview people about their dreams. They would write down what they dreamed. Then they would watch their lives to see what happened. And they said, ah... 
They dreamed about something like this and this happened, so there has to be a connection. And that's how they put together their view of what dream interpretation was. Not very scientific, but that's how they did it. Now, they're called before the king. Notice what they say to the king in verse number four. Then the Chaldeans, the wise men, spoke to the king in Aramaic, saying, O king, live forever. Tell us the dream, and we will declare the interpretation. Now, before we get to that narrative, let's look at one particular thing the passage notes that I don't want to gloss over. It says that the Chaldeans spoke to the king in what language? Aramaic. Aramaic was the common language of the Hebrew of the of the Gentiles. Hebrew was the common language of the Jews. Now, why is it important to know that they did this? Well, here's why. Because the Old Testament is primarily written in Hebrew. However, in the book of Daniel, it's Hebrew from the beginning through chapter 2, verse 3. But chapter 2, verse 4, all the way through chapter 7, it changes to Aramaic. It goes from the common language of the Jews to the common language of the Gentiles. When we hit chapter 8, it goes back to Hebrew. Why? Well, because God is a God, and maybe you've heard this somewhere before. God is a God who meets people right where they're at. So he can move them to where he wants them to be. In parts of the book of Daniel, he's talking to the Jewish people about how to exhibit a humble courage in a heathen culture. But there's another part of this book, chapter 2 through chapter 7, where he's talking to the Gentiles. He, through this dream, is going to show, here's what's coming when it comes to human kingdoms, but all of them will rise and fall. Only the kingdom of God lasts forever. So he uses both languages because he is reaching out to all people. I love that about God. Now, what do these Chaldeans say to the king? They say, king, hold up a second. You kind of are a little mixed up. You got the cart before the horse. You've told us to tell you your dream. But it doesn't work that way. You see, King, you're supposed to tell us your dream. And then we're going to give you the interpretation. Now, what did these guys just do? They just corrected the king. Never a good idea. The only thing worse than correcting an all-powerful narcissistic dictator is correcting one who's already extremely agitated. So... How does the king reply? Well, look at verse 5. The king replied to the Chaldeans, The command for me is firm. Translation? Did I stutter? You heard what I said. I meant what I said. I'm not changing my mind. But now, the king's agitation goes up a notch. And agitated people agitate other people, right? So he ups the ante and he says... If you do not make known to me the dream and its interpretation, you will be torn limb from limb and your houses will be made a rubbish heap. I think the king's a little agitated, don't you? By the way, when it says you'll be torn limb from limb, that wasn't hyperbole. You go back and study the form of execution in the Babylonian Empire, you'll discover that many of them dealt with things as extreme as tearing people from limb to limb. And when it says your houses will be made of rubbish, the word rubbish heap there is the same word meaning a dung heap. Because you know what they did? When somebody went against the king, everything you had was destroyed and the place where it used to stand now became an outhouse for the public. And the king is saying... You are going to tell me the dream and the interpretation or else. But the king does also have a positive side. He's not just giving the stick. He's also giving the carrot because he says in verse 6, but if you declare the dream and its interpretation, if you do what I'm asking you to do, you will receive from me gifts and a reward and great honor. Now that we've cleared all that up, tell me my dream 
and give me the interpretation. Now, folks, these guys have got to be sweating bullets. You talk about being between a rock and a hard place. If they do not do what the king just requested, they're dead. But there's a problem. They cannot do what the king just requested. It's impossible. They can't tell him what his dream was. They have no idea. So the only chance they have is to try again to convince the king to quit putting the cart before the horse. So look what they said in verse 7. So they answered a second time, and this will ultimately be strike two for them. They answered a second time and said, Let the king tell the dream to his servants, and we will gladly declare the interpretation. No sweat, king. We can do this if you'll just tell us the dream. Now, in verse 8, we begin to see why the king took this approach. You see, King Nebuchadnezzar is a lot of things. Stupid was not one of them, okay? Okay? He knew exactly what he was doing. Look what he says in verse 8. The king replied, I know for certain that you are bargaining for time. You're stalling. Inasmuch as you have seen the command for me is firm, I'm not going to change my mind, so quit asking me to. If you do not make the dream known to me, there is only one decree for you. If you don't do what I've asked you to do, The verdict is simple. The truth is simple. It's this. You have agreed together to speak lying and corrupt words before me. Therefore, tell me the dream so I can know its interpretation. Now we see the king's motive. You see, the king realizes these guys are probably frauds. If he just told them the dream, they could give him any interpretation, right? They could make up anything. So here's what the king is saying. There is a surefire way for me to know if the gods have revealed to you the interpretation of my dream. Start by telling me what the dream is. And if you can tell me what the dream is, then I can trust your interpretation. Now that's a good thing to keep in mind. The next time someone comes up to you and says that they can interpret a dream that you had, You say, I had a dream. Well, I can interpret it. You say, great, tell me the dream, and then I'll get the interpretation from you. They probably can't do it, right? That's what the king does here. Because here's what the king is saying. If you can't do this, then you know what that tells me? You've been pulling the wool over my eyes for three years. And you were probably pulling the wool over my father's eyes before me. This is a test. Can they really do what the king has asked them to do? Now, folks these guys are in a mess. They can't do it. But if they tell the king they can't do it, they're dead. If they take a stab at it and it's not accurate, they're dead. There's no good way for them to get out of this. So they try one last tactic. They try to put it back on the king. They try to make the king feel guilty for his request. But there's a problem. You will never get a narcissist to feel guilty about anything. Okay? You just won't. So look what they say to him. Look what it says beginning in verse number 7. I'm sorry. And beginning in verse number 10. It says this. The Chaldeans answered the king and said, King, there is not a man on earth who can declare the matter for the king. Inasmuch as no great king or ruler, and we believe you're one of the great ones, king, has ever asked anything like this of any magician, conjurer, or Chaldean. Moreover, the thing which the king demands is difficult. And there is no one else who could declare it to the king except the gods. And if there's one thing we know about the gods, king, is that they do not dwell among mortal flesh. By the way, that statement would change 600 years later when the very Son of God would take on flesh and dwell among men. So these guys are trying to put it back on the king. Notice their response. 
Basically, they're saying three things. Because this is a last-ditch effort. King number one, this is impossible. What you're asking us to do is impossible. There's not a man alive that can do it. King, this isn't fair. You can't punish us because we can't do something that's impossible. The second thing they say to him is this. It's not only impossible, but King, can we just be so bold as to say this? It's irresponsible. It's irresponsible, King. No great king has ever made a request like this. And and King, we know you always want to be associated with the great ones. You don't want to look like some wacko king over here. That's what's happening. You're not even doing it the way kings are supposed to do it. And not only that, it's irrational. Only the gods can reveal this. And obviously their gods couldn't. Now that, my friend, is what's going to separate Daniel from the rest of them. You see, and we'll see it next week. Daniel is ultimately going to stand before the king. And the king's going to say, Daniel, can you do what I've asked? Can you give me my dream and the interpretation? And Daniel can respond by saying, nope. No man on earth can do that. But then he's going to utter these words. But there is a God in heaven who can. Ladies and gentlemen, don't forget that. I don't know what you're facing in your life. I don't know what challenge you're up against. And it may seem impossible. And there may not to be, there may not be any answer that any man can give you. But I want you to know there is a God in heaven. Well, for these guys, this is strike three. Now, look what happens in verse 12. Because of this. Because these guys have not just corrected the king for a third time, they have called him irresponsible. Because of this, the king, now notice the words carefully, he became indignant and very furious. Do you see the extremity of that? He didn't just become indignant. He became indignant and furious. He didn't just become indignant and furious. He became indignant and very furious. Now how many of you know that when you become indignant and very furious, you usually make a wrong decision? And that's what the king does. Look what he says. And he gave orders to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. All of them. All of them. Not just the ones that stood before him. They were the teachers. They were the leaders. But all of them. You know why? Because if the teachers are frauds, so are the students. That's the king's mindset. Kill them all. Verse 13. So the decree went forth that the wise men, see see the phrase, the wise men, should be slain, all of them. So they went and looked for Daniel and his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, in order to kill them. Why Daniel? Why Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Because they had just finished that three-year indoctrination program. They were now wise men in training. They were proby wise men. That's what they were. But they were part of the group. And the king just ordered that all wise men, doesn't matter if they're teachers or students, how long they've been wise, doesn't matter. They're all to be killed. So the head executioner is gathering them all up. He's got his list of who it is. And Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego are all on the list. So the executioner comes to Daniel's door. Word is already spread. This is a knock of death. Now, here's where we're going to see Daniel's humble courage. Look what it says in verse number 14. There are two words I need you to see. 
Then Daniel replied. Wait, stop for a second. Would you not agree with me that Daniel was in a very rough cultural situation? Would you not agree with me that what Daniel is facing is very unfair? Would you not agree with me that the results are devastating? How would you reply? Many today who tout a harsh courage would respond by saying, that dirty, rotten king, this is unfair. May he rot in hell. And others in the church would go, you are so courageous. But a harsh courage doesn't have any eternal impact. Look how Daniel replies. Then Daniel replied, here's the two words, with discretion and with discernment to Arioch, the captain of the king's bodyguard, the head executioner. How does Daniel respond? With words of condemnation? No. With words of rebuke? No. Daniel responds with words that have been filtered through the filter of discretion and the filter of discernment. I dare say that for many Christians today, if they would begin to filter their social media posts through the filter of discretion and discernment, they probably would make very few posts. By the way, Ephesians gives us what that filter looks like. It says this, let no unwholesome word come out of your mouth, but only that which is good for building up others, that which is seasoned with salt of grace. Daniel responds with discretion, with discernment. And God blesses it. Look at it. Verse 15, he said to Arioch, the king's commander, the head executioner, for what reason is the decree from the king so urgent? Okay, the king has said we all have to die. Why does it have to happen immediately? What's, what's going on? Just a very easy question. Now look what it says. It says, an Arioch, the, the head executioner for the king, informed Daniel about the matter. That blows me away. Because I highly doubt that the head executioner for the king answered many questions of the people he's about to execute. Right? It's probably just shut up. This is the order. But he tells, the, he tells Daniel what's going on. You know why? Because Daniel's humble courage has impacted people. That's why. So look what happens. Verse 16. So Daniel went in and requested of the king that he would give him a little bit of time in order that he might declare the interpretation to the king. Daniel somehow, some way, gets an audience with the king. You know why? Because humble courage impacts people. And the king probably remembered that this Daniel was the guy who stood before him at the end of the three years and the king found him to be ten times wiser than all the others. And he thought, well, maybe this guy has something of value to share. And Daniel says to the king, if you'll just give me a little bit of time, king, I'll give you the answer. Now that's funny because remember it was the king who said to the wise man, you're stalling for time. Off with your heads. But he's going to give Daniel some time. You know why? Because humble courage impacts people. Now, how could Daniel make that claim? King, if you'll give me a little bit of time, I'll give you your dream and the answer. How can he make that claim? Well, remember back in chapter 1, verse 17? The Bible says, as for these four youths, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, God gave them knowledge and intelligence in every branch of literature and wisdom, and Daniel even understood all kinds of visions and dreams. And Daniel knew that. He was now simply relying and trusting on the word of God. 
So King Nebuchadnezzar puts a stay of execution in place. No one's killed you. Going to give Daniel a little bit of time. So what does Daniel do? Verse 17, chapter 2. Then Daniel went to his house and informed his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, about the matter. What does Daniel do when he's facing this huge dilemma? He goes to his crew. He goes to his tribe. He goes to his group. You see, that's why we stress the need for you to have authentic Christian relationships in your life. Because when trials come, and they will, you need your crew. You need your tribe. You need your group. And what do they do? Verse 18. He entreats them that they might request compassion from the God of heaven concerning this mystery so that Daniel's friends would not be destroyed and the rest of the wise men of Babylon would also be saved. Notice what they don't do. They don't go find the books of the magicians to give all the information about if you dream this, it means this. It's not what they do. They go back to their home and they pray. Ladies and gentlemen, I heard a pastor say it this week. I loved it. He said, the best method of protest is prayer. Yeah, you can protest the way the world protests. Ain't going to accomplish much. But nothing of eternal importance ever happens apart from prayer. And the best form of protest is prayer. Now, here's what we're going to see next week. Next week, we're going to see that God is going to answer Daniel's prayer. That very night, God's going to show him the dream the king had and the interpretation, and he's going to stand before the king. And and, and I'm going to share with you, show you how that dream shows the kingdoms of the world and how ultimately it will all end. Next week's message is entitled, The Rise and Fall of Everyone. That's, That's the title next week. But before he goes in before the king, Daniel is so in awe that God in his compassion has revealed to him the mystery. That he utters out this prayer of praise that is as rich as rich can be. We're going to start with that prayer of praise next week, but we're not going to wait till next week to read it. It's rich, rich. So here's what I'd like you to do. As the broadcast continues to all of our campuses, I would like to have everyone who's able, no matter where you are, would you stand, whether you're at the Gaylor campus, the Sioux campus, online, maybe you're watching at home, wherever you are, would you stand? Because I want to end by reading these four verses. It's, it's, it's absolutely staggering. It's amazing. It's rich. And what's going to happen is this. When, when I get done reading it, I'm going to say, and all God's people said, and you all are going to shout, amen. Did you hear that? And as soon as you say amen, the broadcast is going to end to the Sioux and Jeff will take over up there. And we're going to go right in to a powerful song of worship that declares that we serve a God who can turn graves into gardens. Now, as I read this, I need you to understand this is rich. This is Daniel overwhelmed by God. When's the last time you were overwhelmed by the truth of God? Do you know in the Bible what people did when they were overwhelmed about the truth of who God was? They shouted. Did you know that? The Bible says, shout to the Lord with the voice of triumph. Psalm 100 says, shout joyfully to the Lord. 
So here's what I'd like us to do. As I read this prayer, if there's a part of it, a phrase of it, a word of it, that you just totally agree with, that's my God, then I want you to shout out an amen at that point. That's what the word amen means. So be it. Just shout it when the time comes. And if I read a truth about God that resonates with your spirit and you're going, I love that about God, then I want you just to rip out a hallelujah. It means praise the Lord. I want you to put your inhibitions aside. Say, preacher, are you trying to make us Pentecostal? Don't worry, we're not going there. We're not going there. We're not going there. But I do want us to be biblical. And shouting to the Lord. It's a biblical response. So I'm going to read it. You're going to respond all the way through it. And then we're going to worship the Lord together. Again, and some of you are thinking, just read it for crying out loud. <laughs> as soon as we're done, broadcast will end. We're going to go right into that song of worship. So as I read, let me just read. Here we go. Let the name of God be blessed forever. For wisdom and power belong to him. It is he who changes the times. It is he who changes the epics. He removes kings. And he establishes kings. Well, that ought to get a big one. He gives wisdom to wise men. And knowledge to men of understanding. It is he and he alone who reveals the profound and hidden things. Our God knows what's in the darkness. And the light dwells within him. To you, O God of my fathers, I give thanks. To you, O God of my fathers, I give praise. For you have given me wisdom. And you have given me power. Even now you have made known to me what we requested of you. For you have made known to us the king's dream. And all God's people shouted. Let's worship.